because he knows the time is short. Let him who hath understanding reckon the number of the beast. For it is a human number. Its number is 666. You know when you know when astrologers talk about a planetary lineup, this conjunction only happens once in a blue moon sort of thing. What you have in Number of the Beast is is the sort of the musical equivalent. We thought it was a good album, you know, strong album, but that's about it. You don't think you, you know, you don't sort of walk out the studio and think, wow, we've just made history. You don't think like that. Welcome, folks, to Friday night. Hey, it is Audiotopsy. Guys, I want to just say thanks right away to all the feedback that we've been getting about this show. There's some people out there that are figuring out what we're doing, and I think that's kind of cool. There are other people that don't like what we're doing, and hey, that's cool, too. Uh, I get that. I understand that. We've dealt with all of it. And uh, if you notice, the uh, screen looks a little bit different tonight. Uh, we have... Our friend, yes, our, our friend, Pastor Sean, that uh, saw the topic, saw the song that we're going to do, and he raised his hand and said, hey, I have some things to say about that. So uh, we're going to give him a chance to uh, chime in here in a few minutes. But tonight we're talking about the song, The Number of the Beast by Iron Maiden. Okay, uh, there's a lot of things to be said about this. I remind... My memory goes back to hanging out in record stores while well, my mom's a few stores down shopping for clothes or whatever. And I used to spend hours flipping through records. And I, again, was just kind of like, whoa, this looks evil. Okay. Mm -hmm. And even all of the Iron Maiden uh, album covers, like I was looking for secrets and hidden, you know, um, uh, messages in the cover and symbols and things like that. And I'm like, oh, dude, these guys are bad news. And I don't want anything to do with them. But I I am looking at, I looked at the album covers, you know, and I talked about this before from King Diamond to Iron Maiden to Ozzy Osbourne, all those guys. And I'm like, uh, for some reason, you're just kind of like, uh, it's like, you know, you slow down to look at a car wreck, kind of like, oh, gosh, is it, this is crazy. But guys, um, we're gonna we're gonna jump into it here in a minute. So um, uh, I know you're gonna have some things to say about the song, but uh, Pastor Sean, uh, since you're you're kind of new here, what I mean, what were your thoughts when you saw that we were gonna you know do this song? Uh, you wanted to kind of jump in here. Well, I have a lot of of um, I could say water on the bridge. Iron Maiden was my favorite band growing up. Uh, I think she's going to put, that's, that's awesome. me in my yearbook. Uh, the yearbook <laughs> now that, I love it. I love it. That's keep great. that, yeah, keep that up there, folks. Now, if I would have ran that into that it. guy in the hallway at school, I would have called I, a prayer I, meeting. That, I'm telling you, you what. You can't see um, it. I had about a 10 inch rat tail in the back. Yep. Oh, <laughs> um, so, but yeah, I, I was an Iron Maiden, um, Metallica, Ozzy Osbourne. Uh, Metallica kind of came on a state scene a little bit later for me. In fact, I didn't think they were strong enough at the beginning, believe it or not. But I fell in <laughs> love with them after a while because I was and one of the reasons I loved Iron Maiden. And I know a lot of people are not going to like this, but they, they weren't wearing they weren't trying to be feminine. They they were actually trying to be male. You know, Bruce Dickerson, I kind of looked up to him in a way he was a fencer. I actually got his autograph. Uh, in, in a fencing um, thing that he uh, expedition he did here in the United States back in um, I think it was 90, 91, somewhere in there. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of history that I have with Iron Maiden. So I, when I saw it, man, I was just like, I need to be on there for just a brief moment. Mm -hmm. 
Hey, well, no, and I know you have some thoughts about the song that we're going to cover. Um, all of this is relevant, you know, and I, I want to mention real quick. Um, uh, I'm thinking about uh, my friend Russ Dizdar. It's uh, coming up on a year here pretty soon since we lost him. Mm -hmm. But Russ Dizdar was an old metalhead. And he liked, you know, back before he got saved, he was listening to Sabbath and a lot of that, you know, that old stuff. And then after he got saved, he was listening to Christian metal, you know, for a long time and Christian rock, and he liked it. So he would be a guy that would probably fit in this mix today and have things to say about this, definitely about this song, Number of the Beast. So let's get in. Um, we're going to listen to the song. But I want to go ahead and play that next clip, um, Katie, where they're talking about the making of the song a little bit. So let's jump into that, and then we're going to get into the lyrics of the song. So um, here we go. I wanted a, a certain atmosphere to be set up on those four lines. I left alone. My mind was blank. I needed time to think to get the memories from my mind. What did I see? Can I believe that what I saw that night was real and not just fantasy? We spent, uh, oh, about four hours on the first four lines. To the extent that I got so pissed off, I was throwing chairs across the room. And in the end, I was like, what do you want? Ah, you know? And when he got the one that he wanted, he was like, yeah, that's it. And I, and I just sort of went, why? <laughs> why? I don't understand. And now I understand a little bit better. Kenny, can you just talk a little bit about the music? Okay, and just yeah. not the production and you know uh, the guitar a little bit coming into this. Well, I'm gonna I'm gonna tell you a little something about me. Unlike Sean, I didn't really get into Iron Maiden until around '87, wasted years time. I, I started playing guitar in '83. Iron Maiden wasn't really on my radar as much, and I'll tell you why. When I saw the song was called Six 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 and I'm the Beast, I didn't want anything to do with it. It scared me, man. I was like. That was the, and that was at a time period when I didn't, I, you know, I was already starting to look into rock, but it wasn't until later when I like I learned waste of years, I started going back to their catalog and reading and kind of seeing what's going on with it. And then and then I got to be a bigger fan of them. Now I'll tell you something interesting about this song that I think is really neat. It's called it's called the number of the beast six six six. The song actually starts in four four, it means there's four beats in the measure, but it switches to six four and it keeps doing that. Six four 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 six four four, and there's this six thing going through the whole thing. And I think it's really interesting because it makes the song kind of it feels off, like you're constantly having this little shift. And I and of course, you know, when I when I first listened to this stuff back years ago, I didn't understand that. Now I look at it and say it's it's pretty it's pretty uh pretty smart how they how they did that. And then when the main verses come in, it's straight four four rock just straight on, but. That little throw off of that lick, da 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 it just it keeps shifting the bar. So I always thought that was really interesting musically wise, but um yeah, it's it's a it's an interesting song for sure. Vic, jump in here. We're gonna we're gonna listen to the lyrics here in a minute, folks. Yeah. I have a long history with Iron Maiden. So I was in eighth grade and my brother was in ninth grade. So he went off to high school and that's where metal was discovered for us. Cause it never was anywhere in our house. And one of the very first things he ever brought home was a friend's VHS concert uh, footage. And so at this point it was probably like 84, 85. So mm. the album had been out a few years, but this was the video that he brought home. And so we were watching this conference and I think, at 13, I was maybe a little bit bored by it because like Sean said, it was like such a guy's band at that mm -hmm. point, you know. And like Kenny, I kind of got into it on my own more later. Like even though in like high school, I think I know I had Number of the Beast on record. I had Power Slave on record. I think I had one of their other ones on record. And 
I think what I love the most about them is their riffs. Their riffs are just very, very catchy, like the Trooper. And I love the way that um, the thing I like about Maiden and Metallica back then was the harmony, like the rhythm and the lead mm -hmm. guitar would, mm -hmm. would play the same things. They'd harmonize in different keys. And I love that. And so I love the riffs. But I kind of got more into them later, like in my 30s. But it was always the old stuff, you know, uh, Run to the Hills and Hallowed Be Thy Name and all that kind of stuff. <clears throat> but uh, but all all I remember is the very first time we watched that concert video, we were over at our grandma's house. We were sleeping over at my grandma's house and we were watching on this like tiny little TV. And I just remember my grandma walking into the room and just staring at that thing. And she was kind of okay until Eddie, you know, their big skate, their spinal tap stage gimmick came out. And so Eddie comes out dancing the big skull puppet and she had enough and she put her foot down and demanded that that tape come out. So we had to stop watching at yeah. that point. So, so yeah. You, you know, I remember uh, my cousins having the albums, having the t-shirts and I'm just like, this is close enough for me. You guys shouldn't be listening to this. I'm not going to listen to it. Sa same thing. Um, uh, Kenny, I was like, okay, they pretty much made it obvious whose side they're on and uh yeah i'm going to stay away from it but so this song the number of the beast there's a lot of stuff in here now let me say lyrically i feel like it's in a way not very poetic okay like it reuses some of the same words it's very immature you know as far as not showing maturity as a writer okay um in my opinion all right uh, you, and you maybe you'll see you guys will see some of that stuff, but um, anyway, uh, you know, sonically and production wise, I think it's uh, you know close to perfection. Uh, you know, vocally, uh, Bruce uh, Dickinson, um, amazing vocalist. Uh, so let's go ahead and get into uh, this first clip here. We're gonna see some of the lyrics for the song, uh, and uh, we're gonna come back and comment on them. So let's check this out. In my old dreams Was a reflection of my woman staring back at me Cause in my dreams It's always there The evil face that twists my mind and brings me to despair So and you know, I don't know if Katie's got those lyrics. I want to read from the beginning to then, and then I want to hear from Sean um, if she's got a page uh, that um, that we can bring up. And okay, from the uh, okay uh, from the intro, it says, uh, "I left alone. My mind was blank. I needed time to think to get the memories from my mind." What did I see? Can I believe that what I saw that night was real and not just fantasy? Just what I saw in my old dreams were the reflections of my warped mind staring back at me. Because in my dreams, it's always been there, the evil face that twists my mind and brings me to despair. Okay, so this, uh, this writer is talking about something where he's seeing a vision and he doesn't know if it's real or if it's not, okay? Now, um, I'm not trying to put things in there that's not there. Um, Sean, you have some things to say about this. As I'm reading this at this moment, it made me think of this. Because we know that the book of Revelation was written on the Isle of Patmos, okay? And it was, you know, this is something... Uh, God gave Jesus a revelation and the Lord sent his angel to John. Okay. We know that at the beginning of the book of revelation and I'm not trying, you know, I'm not trying to put something in the song that's not there or say that it's not, but it's interesting that there, you know, the book of revelation is a vision given to John and this guy's talking about it here. And he's, he's asking, is this real or is this not? What are your thoughts on the content of this song, Sean, and, uh, what I just said? Well, there's, there's a, there's, we could talk for a couple of hours and I know you don't want to do that, but uh, the first thing is I believe you're right. I mean, you could be kind of talking about it from that aspect, but I also believe if you think about the SRA issue, 
um, this is a dissociation issue. Um, it's also talking about a ritual. As you go deeper into the lyrics, it's all a ritual that they're talking about. So I, I don't think, you know, some people will try to pass it off and say, oh, it's not a ritual, but it is. And, and I've actually walked in. Uh, I had to actually go after a teenager one time whose family called me and they were strung out and I walked in the drug house, me and another guy, and they were playing this. They were actually doing rituals at the moment to this song. They were, they were using this song as a part of their ritual. And there's a number of songs that Bruce Dickerson has wrote. In fact, y'all may get into this a little bit later, not sure, but he, he actually considers himself the magician in a lot of his songs. He's the magician. Um, and I'm not quite sure who wrote this particular song, but it does switch often, like Kenny says, from and when it switches, you kind of get the sense that it's going in and out of ritual um, ideas. So when it switches, it's talking about the, the ritual aspect of it. But um, the, the, the first part of the song, you'll probably get back into it later, too where they're quoting revelations, they're quoting there's different verses. Again, that's part of the ritual. Mm -hmm. um, and, and so you also see some of these guys, not only Bruce Dickerson, but I think Steve Harris has, it's either Steve or um, Adrian, but I can't remember which one. Now I know some will say Nico has professed to be a Christian, but he's also kind of weighing on some of the OTO channels. So I would be very careful how we, how we mm. say one or two is a Christian or not a Christian. I'm not here to judge, but I don't know if I would paint a lot of this as, as necessarily the good old boys just using evil as a, as to sell music. There's, there's some stuff that's deeper right here. So I'll just kind of leave it there and kind of see what y'all think. Well, no. And I, I appreciate that. And I'm glad you came on with that mm. perspective. Um, uh, I mentioned before the show that I know that um, uh, Bruce Dickinson was involved in the production of a movie about Crowley. Okay. Mm -hmm. And um, I, I don't know much more beyond that, but obviously he wanted to put that out there. Yeah, there you go. The name of the movie is chemical wedding. I don't know much about the movie. I saw it in a, I saw it for sale one time in a store and I picked it up and I was like, what is this about Crowley? And it's a, yeah. So uh, you you saw the movie, yeah. What uh, can you tell us anything about the movie since you saw it, Sean? Uh, don't watch it. It's full of full of ritual. It's full of alchemy. It's full of esoteric Christianity. And, and plus, I also wanted to say this. That's be a good way to say it. A lot of the stuff that even some of the bands and the songs you already talked about is used a lot in esoteric Christianity, which means they're going to talk about Christ. They're going to talk about these things. They're even going to say Christian knees but they're twisting it in a way that you have to be very careful. And so a lot of these ideas that's being tossed, especially when you get in, when you start understanding true OTO and Crowley, a lot of the, what he was doing with Christianity was twisting it into the fact of esoteric Christianity and Luciferianism. So um, a lot of what Steve and, the writers, I think Steve Harris is probably one of the main writers, but I think David yes. Mary or Mary is also another writer. Um, these guys, if you listen to the lyrics, especially at the very beginning of the songs, Fear of the Dark, for example, again, is talking about another ritual taking place in a park. So isn't that interesting? We know back in that time period when we have the Son of Sam, uh, Zodiac Killer, a lot of these things mm. were happening in the park, so to speak. So there's a lot of things happening in this music that, that I feel is very telling about the spiritual nature of, of what's happening. Um, no, no. And uh, I, um, I think that's a good perspective, and I'm glad that you mentioned that. Like I said, I knew about uh, Bruce Dickinson, but I didn't know about Steve Harris. So, uh, and he's, uh, uh, I guess, uh, written some books, some occultic books or, you know, things like this. Well, I'm not really sure. I know that one of the band members in, and this is very obscure, but I know that they, one of the band members, either Steve or Dave has written a book under a pseudonym with an OTO member and president. 
So, and I'm not quite sure, I'm not willing to go out and say which one it is, but I do know that there has been some writing from an OTO perspective because OTO is all over a lot of this stuff. So, right, right. Well, and then um, obviously they're very familiar with Crowley. Okay. Uh, 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 Bruce produced a movie. Okay. Um, about Crowley. So there, it's not like they don't know what this is. Um, and other titles, obviously, uh, I think a song by Maiden, uh, Bring Your Daughter to the Slaughter, um, you know, um, and also uh, they have a song called Run to the Hills, which is about the Manifest Destiny. So uh, I, uh, th they're not a band that I was like really comfortable you know, checking out. Now, a few years ago, I probably li listened to more Iron Maiden than I ever had just because my interest was kind of peaked. And it was uh, it was one of those things. And I was working on another project. So I'd put them on the background. I'm like, what are these guys about? You know, and I listened mm -hmm. to a lot of uh, more of them a few years ago than I ever have. Um, uh, you know, in the past, I was like, eh, I, I don't I don't even want to entertain that. So um, now uh, the only, I guess the only thing that that I would just question is, um, uh, and, and I'm not, I'm not disagreeing with you, Pastor Sean, but these guys, the lyrics are plain, right? We know they don't have to basically uh, hide anything, you know, um, or or we don't have to suspect that they're hiding anything because uh, up front there's the lyrics, you know. We see, you know, bands do different things. Uh, maybe Led Zeppelin. I don't know if this is a good example, Sean, but um, they're more maybe poetic about how they insert their occultism, you know. And then there's mm -hmm. other bands that are more, um, they're more sneaky about it, okay. And mm -hmm. even though, you know, they have a song called Stairway to Heaven, all right, but... Uh, that song was not about going to heaven at all. All right. Mm -hmm. Um, and we know Jimmy Page was, you know, involved in the occult, in, you know, a follower of Crowley. Um, there are other stories of bands. Uh, I, I just give an example, the band, uh, Malevolent Creation. Okay. I think that's the band where the producer said, we saw these guys in the studio doing rituals. Okay. Mm -hmm. As they're making their music. Mm. Right. And the reason I know this is because he produced some Christian albums, too. So um, I, I, I just want to ask anybody, does anybody have any more information, some interviews, statements from the band um, where they're they're saying, hey, this is, you know, we know from the lyrics that's what they were into. But was it was it their agenda? OK, not saying that it wasn't. You know, mm -hmm. uh, it was more obvious, like, I think, with groups like Led Zeppelin and some of these straight out, like, satanic bands. Um, and I, I'm, I'm interested. We're going to put out, we're going to show some videos a little bit later on and let the audience, you know, kind of judge what do you what do you guys think, you know, where these guys stand. But anyway, Pastor Sean, I want to give you uh, the last word. I know you got to go. You're just dropping in here. And uh uh, we appreciate you uh, sharing your high school um, uh, <laughs> yearbook picture. Yeah. That was kind of cool. Mm -hmm. So I think it's kind of neat. It's interesting that this band, in a way, has touched all of our lives in a way, and we have something to say. But I want to give you the last word. Well, again, I, I don't, you know, I think it's hard-pressed to, to say, okay, they were outright Satanists. I think absolutely they're alchemists, and I don't think they would probably have a problem with saying that. Uh, in fact, you, even in the video clip you just played on air, he's talking about astrology. He's talking. He's and every time you hear Bruce, even when he had cancer, he's talking about the, the his belief system out front and open. So I don't think that that's kind of a stretch to say that he's some type of alchemist. Um, and he again, he calls himself the magician in, in a lot of his stuff. So, um, but the biggest thing I, I think that I would warn people is even with a lot of this music. I would be very careful with people who claim to be Christian and we need to know, know that there's esoteric Christianity that's used a lot in new age and a lot in the occult and a lot with Crowley. 
And so when someone is referencing Crowley, then they turn around and say, I'm a Christian. That don't necessarily, you know, I'm sitting here as, as, as an ex Iron Maiden. I have to be honest. I've listened to them in, there was a time I, I forgot I had it on my iPod and I was out there working out and I was like, Oh man, Maiden's on. Okay. <laughs> but I'm, I'm going to sit down and say it right here, right now. I don't recommend listening to Maiden because it will mess with you spiritually. I think that's good advice. And uh, they, I mean, obviously, uh, there, there, uh, there's comments out there that we're going too soft on this band. Uh, I, sure, uh, I sure as heck don't mean to, but we're, we're looking for the truth. And I think that uh, what you just said in identifying them as alchemist is, uh, you know, is is accurate and i want to i want to hear from somebody if you disagree with sean if you disagree with us um if somebody's a satanist uh we're not trying to cover up for them uh again uh it's pr the lyrics are pretty obvious and we're only talking about one song maybe the the most nefarious song for this band and even though it we're talking 40 over 40 years old now so well, i'll tell one more story and then i'm gonna go um i've seen these guys live and in person um, once in Greensboro, once in Charlotte, and I believe uh, once uh, around Washington, D.C. somewhere. I was one of those kids in the front row hollering, maiden, 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 if I could remember it. I'll have to be honest with you. A lot of the times I was so high, I couldn't have to remember it. I mean, I'm just being honest. And um, one of the nights that I jumped out of the car was coming home from that. I don't know how fast the car was going. One of the nights we were actually coming home from an Iron Maiden concert, and they couldn't find me for about five or six hours. Mm. So I'm not blaming Iron Maiden. I blame the 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 stuff that I was taking, okay? But, uh, again, it's just uh, that atmosphere. If you go to the – if you went to these things uh, and, and you saw what we saw, we've done what we've done, you go in and you see the rituals and you hear what they have to say. Again, just be very careful. Listen, Tom, thank you for having me. I'll bow out. Thank, here. We'll no, see. thank you, Pastor Sean. I want to say one more thing. Praise God for salvation and Amen. praise God for taking you out of that life and saving you and using you now. Here we are talking about it. And regardless, uh, I'm assuming a lot of people have tuned in maybe because they're fans of Iron Maiden. And there is salvation even for fans of Iron Maiden. Amen? <laughs> yeah, I, I'm a testimony. Hey, I, you know. And I would, by the way, if Bruce Dickerson's watching this, I'd love to finch you, bro. <laughs> uh, well, I don't know if he's going to get the message, but uh, <laughs> let us know if he does. I'll be there to film it. So, oh, yeah, you see, cut right through. Me. Hey, we'll see you. Hey, God bless you, Sean. Thank you so much. See you, Thank Sean. you so much. So, uh, anyway, guys, um, I want to I want to jump back into this, and uh, Sean was only could only be with us for a little while, so we wanted to give him the floor. But we can kind of get into the song and continue to talk about it. Uh, uh, he gave us a lot of uh, perspective there. And I think we're going to see, as we listen to more of the song, we're going to see some of the things that he's talking about here. Um, when you, you are going to those concerts, when you are partaking of substances, as he referenced, okay, in his former life, um, that is a recipe, okay? Whether... Um, the musicians know it or not. Okay. I look at Iron Maiden as puppets, just like we were, we were talking about earlier this week, Crowley and LaVey as puppets. Okay. Uh, they are preachers preaching the message, no doubt about it. And they don't, they don't care about twisting the scripture. So let's get into a little bit more of this song. And, uh, I, we're going to play, um, uh, interview in a little bit. And I think it's uh, and, and read uh, read an article, and I, I want to see what people have to say about it. So let's um, let's go ahead and uh, get some more into this.
Okay. So, Vic, jump in there. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so I want to go back to the beginning where they, they quote the revelation. Oh, I just want to say a couple things about that. And yeah. Tom, you and I have talked about this on so many of our shows. These Satanists would have nothing to talk about if they didn't have the Bible. The foundation of everything that they believe in and that they twist and that they build upon and that they preach about, it's all the foundation of it, the bedrock of it is, is the scriptures. And what I think is so like ironic about this, and I it was interesting when Sean said that that's part of the rituals, quoting these scriptures, you know, and you get the evil Vincent Price sounding guy at the beginning, and that wasn't Vincent Price, but, um, you know, what what's interesting about that revelation verse is for he knows the time was short you're you're building upon a foundation of of a bible verse and everyone in the crowd is like yeah yeah like screaming at this bible verse when the verse is literally foretelling the demise of this beast the time is short like you're screaming and cheering at the fact that your leader is going to lose this war like contextually it just becomes ironic that that's the verse that they're quoting. And um, I, it, this is completely coincidental. I just find it interesting. We know that when scripture was first written, there weren't chapters and verses. Those were added later. And I don't know if this was something esoteric that was done intentionally on behalf of the band or the writer, because I know they're really big into gematria and numerology. But it coincidentally happens to be Revelation 13, 18. And 13, of course, is in major occult number. It's a, it's a very charged number. 11 and 13 are kind of the big, you know, occult numbers. So you've got Revelation chapter 13, and then you've got verse 18. And uh, obviously, 18 is divisible by six three times. So you've got 666 is the 18. And I thought that fit in kind of nicely with what Kenny was saying about when you're jarring between a six, four and a four, four time measure, you're actually in separating it. You're putting in the six, 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 cause you got the six, mm -hmm. the six measure, the six measure, the six measure. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but another thing I want to add, and you know, this is just for, you know, perhaps people who are maiden fans and don't know much about the scripture, even six, six, six is a very esoteric, uh, anomaly that the scripture never says six, six, six. In the mm -hmm. Greek, it says his number is 600, 600, mm -hmm. 60, 60, 6, 6. So this whole concept that it's a 6 and a 6 and a 6, uh, linguistically, the way it's written out in the Greek is his number is 600 and 60 and 6. So mm -hmm. even all of this gematria that they do where they're trying to you know, put all this meaning into the 666 and you know where they try to take certain people's names and numerically at 666 so they're the beast and all this stuff. That that's a bunch of nonsense because uh if you're going to the literal scriptures it it isn't three sixes. It's a 600, it's a 60 and it's a 6. Yeah. Go ahead, Ken. Um <laughs> Yeah, I, you know, just the what, what we're talking about there and looking at, and like I said early on, I didn't, I wasn't really a Maiden fan. I'm gonna, I'm gonna say, I wish I'd gotten to say this while Sean was on here. I was thinking about it. he was talking about Alchemy, Alchemist, the one of the first bands I ever had. We were called Alchemy. Now, hmm. I didn't understand the connotation of that. It was just a cool name. Our album cover had, I was thinking of it from the terms of lead and gold and transmutation. So it was like I had PB and AU on some things that looked like Ching. That to me was alchemy. I didn't know the occult aspects of that. So we have a band and we were we had no satanic dark stuff. It was very kind of pop rock and metal things into it. But we called ourselves alchemy. So sometimes I think about it that there's people that sometimes can look just like you're saying, they they look at the the overall the outside, the easy part of the onion, just like saying six six six. You peel that back. There's more to it than that. To me, like we named our band, we didn't. I didn't know any kind of thing like that. It was, oh, this is a cool, cool. This will make a cool picture for an album cover. So, and and I will say this: as I've read these lyrics for this Iron Maiden song, I what I'm amazed about is it's kind of talking about him seeing these things in the darkness and the mist in the face. But the after the last for the very last chorus. It goes into the last verse. He said he starts talking about it. The perspective changes to first person, I, and mm -hmm. and I think at that point it's Satan. So 
earlier in the song, he's singing at it from what's going like he's being the stuff. And then later it's like, I, I, and I always yeah. thought that was really interesting how the perspective changes. Mm. Uh, and I'm not sure if that was intentional or just, it feels like it um, was. Yeah. You know, um, going back to the making of the album and the band at the time, uh, and, and probably this happens with a lot of bands and a lot of people, you know, we're talking about 40 years ago, right? Um, this band is not the same that they were, you know, 40 years ago, not saying that, you know, these guys are saints or saved or anything now. I mean, we're going to, we're going to play the testimony in a little bit and people can make up their own mind. Um, I, this, I guess this is my question. This is the evidence that I'm looking for, uh, with a lot of people. Okay. That are Satanist. They will go and they will say, yeah, we're Satanist and this is what we meant. And yeah. this is what we're preaching, and this is what we're doing. We're recruiting, okay? I didn't see any of that with Iron Maiden. And um, I guess, you know, uh, and, and we have, you know, other bands that would say, this is exactly what we meant. You know what I'm saying? This is exactly what we're doing, okay? Now, we understand that lying is their language, okay? Um and maybe they didn't tell the truth about what they were doing and their motives because they wanted to cover up and they didn't want anybody to know that they were Satanist. Okay. Or, um, I, I think Sean said it right, that they're more alchemist than anything. And they're involved in esoteric stuff and occultic stuff, but probably not Satanist. Okay. So, um, just for the sake of the listener, and I'm not trying to argue with Sean, but, um, he, he could only be here for a short time. He had to go. So, um, but for maybe for anybody out there that's listening or any, you know, anybody else, um, that agrees or disagrees, I don't, I guess I don't see the evidence and I'm looking for it and I'm asking for anybody to bring, you know, to, to show something, to share a link or something like that to say, Hey, we were, this is what we were doing. We were trying to recruit for the devil. Um, there are plenty of people out there that were doing that, you know, uh, one a good example maybe would be King Diamond, and he wasn't necessarily a recruiter, but he was definitely doing, you know, not making any bones about, you know, he was a Satanist. Okay, so not defending these guys, but um, when they talk about this period, uh, they kind of um, uh, just uh, mentioned that hey, we kind of figured out that this was very, you know, exploitive. I look at them exploiting those Bible verses, you know, mm -hmm. and um, Sean said they're part of a ritual. I'm not going to disagree with them. And I think that Satanists use, um, uh, you know, Bible verses in their ritual a lot. Obviously, we know Satan himself is incapable of quoting scripture correctly. We can see that in God's word. OK, mm -hmm. uh, he always twists it. OK, uh, you know, we brought up the reference recently of um of Gavin Newsom from California twisting the scripture right in his ad for abortion. Pretty sick. Mm -hmm. So let's jump back in. Let's, let's go ahead and get ready for the next uh, clip here and let's examine some more of these lyrics. Talk more about it. Guys, I want to hear your comments about um, what do you think about this song? And we're going to talk also about the number of the beast as well and the beast. So let's go ahead. Okay, what do you guys think? <laughs> so I, I think the thing, I think the thing that always confused me about the song was the beast is a very specific character in scripture. He's a very specific entity that comes on the scene at a very particular time in in the timeline, and he has one specific kind of role he plays out, and so. When when you watch the video and when you even listen to the lyrics, and so the the official story is that one of the guitar players watched one of the Omen movies, Omen Three or something, and had a nightmare. And this is about his nightmare. And if you look 
if you watch the video, I mean, it's, it's very spinal tap. If you watch it now, it's just, they got like the guys in the red leotards with the devil horns and every sort of horror movie character is, is, is showing up. And it, it's such a mishmash of just every cliche kind of horror movie thing. It, it really doesn't have to do with, with the actual beast in revelation like it's not telling that story it's not talking about that guy so i think that's sometimes why i tend to not take a lot of this stuff real seriously by way of you know religious material because it's like to me it just seems like some creative director got in there and it's like okay we got to have the guy with the trident and we've got to have the frankenstein character and now here's the wolf man and Oh, we got to get the pentagram in there. And there's a point where when you put all those things together, they just contradict each other. And it really doesn't have anything to do with scripture. So it just kind of seems kind of like what you said at the beginning of the show with the lyrics, Tom. It just seems so amateurish that it just seems to me that the real Satanists, you know, these generational Satanists, the ones that, you know, we talked about on Tuesday's show, these are the guys that... Uh, they aren't running around with black hair dye and pentagram necklaces. The, the, the generational Satanists, they're covert. They're, they're teaching your kids Sunday school. That's who they are. You know what? Um, yeah, I agree with that. This, this was the soundtrack. Um, I want to be careful what I say here. Um, I, I don't want to generalize. Okay. Um, when we saw new stories of Satanist, the the self-styled what dale griffiths would call experimenters the teenagers with the heavy in the into the heavy metal stuff that got a hold of the satanic bible okay your sean sellers your ricky casso okay ozzy and iron maiden music was present okay um no doubt about it these guys were the soundtrack for those cases okay those satanic cases and we, you know, we could talk about satanic panic here. Um, there's there are people that are saying, okay, satanic panic, satanic panic. What are you talking about? Panic. It was there. This was Satanism. This was about Satan. They were preaching about Satan. Okay. Um, whether they were Satanist or not. And I don't think every one of these bands were Satanist, but they figured out, oh, this is cool. This could make us some money. They were exploiting the Bible and Satanism. Okay. So mm -hmm. you guys know that we've been talking about making good identifications. Uh, I think that there were also a lot of bands that were Satanist and you never knew that they were, you know what I'm right. saying? So, um, and, um, we talked earlier in the week, uh, LaVey talked, uh, there's uh, quotes from him and he's talking about how television is preaching the satanic message okay and the newscasters are the satanic priest and there was a lot of truth to that you know mm -hmm. um anyway, anyway let's uh uh maybe we can go kenny i, I want to give you a chance to jump in did you where we at i lost i lost track here no i was just thinking about like some of the things like i said there there is an amateur ish kind of thing to the lyrics like and and but as a but if you were a teenage boy, which a lot of this was really geared toward, you didn't have to tell the, the correct story. It didn't have to be about the actual beast and revelation. It was just scatter this in there, you know, talking about oh the ritual's done, Satan's work is done, and you get into it, and that's you know it may not be the real story, but it, I will say this also that this kind of stuff is it is a little bit like proselytizing. There is seed planting of satanic imagery that can mm -hmm. be done. And I think that then it becomes on the person themselves. If they're, it, they may be a very accept, uh, you know, susceptible to this, to hear this kind of stuff, especially teenagers are kind of, they're experimenting with drugs. They're having a lot of issues and all these things and bullies and stuff. And this is empowering to them. So mm -hmm. there's aspects of that in there. Um, that never seemed to be my issue with this kind of stuff. I never felt, like it in nothing like I would read, listen to this and be like, oh my gosh, I want to go worship Satan and I'm going to read. And, now, and, I, and I'll, I'll say this, I, it did make me study a lot of things to understand as aspects of a cult. And, you know, you learn all this stuff with it, but but uh, it did make me want to, to be part of it. But I just think it's really interesting. This one here, this story, 
it's like I said, it, it's like you're hearing it like he's watching, he's scared, but he's also kind of exhilarated, like, I don't know what's going on here. And here's these things. And then right. by the end of the song, it shifts to I and it's Satan, which is pretty interesting for me, you know, like I said, but yeah, I think that's a good observation. And you can see, I, I feel like the message uh, of this song, I felt this way. I'm looking at it a little bit different today as we're listening to it. But I felt for a long time the message of this song is basically join us because we're more powerful. You know, and the devil's going to win. Okay, mm -hmm. is the message. So let's look at it again. Let's look at some more um, lyrics here and listen to a little bit more of this song. The Number of the Beast by Iron Maiden. Here we go. Okay, so there's that point, Kenny, where there's a change is made, where yeah. he's saying, I need to call the cops. Yeah. <laughs> because something, yeah. this is illegal. They're talking about, it sounds like a human sacrifice. And right before, right there, he's saying, yeah, I need to warn. We need to do something. Is this real? Uh, you know, and it's almost like some of those, um, some of those uh, movies from the 70s where somebody stumbles on a, a satanic uh, coven, okay? and But then they get drawn in. And the whole story behind some of these movies is the the person gets re recruited into the, the occult or to the mm -hmm. satanic cult. And then he switches and he says, 666, the number of the beast, 666, the one for you and me. So mm -hmm. right there he switches. And a minute ago he was saying, I got to I got to call the police. Now he's saying this is the way. This is the way. Guys, what's your thoughts? Yeah, so I want to kind of mix together something that Sean said with something that Kenny said. Sean said at the top of the show that the the lyric was very reminiscent of SRA and disassociation and alter personalities where, you mm -hmm. know, is this real or dreaming going in and out of different personalities which I think fits great with the switch of the four, four to the six, four, because you've got the four, four, that's normal and yeah. you know, everything's fine. And then you've got the frenzy, you know, so even the music is going in and out of these altered states of consciousness, but um, the, the movie split, you know, the M night Shyamalan movie split um, oh, yeah. in that movie, he had like, what was it? 23 personalities. Don't quote me on that. It was something like that. But then there was this 24th, that had never shown himself. And the, the psychiatrist was trying to convince him that's not an altar. That and the, and that that altar was called the beast. the beast. And the beast ultimately took over as the front-facing personality at the very end. And the and the beast had uh, supernatural powers too. The beast had supernatural powers, and all the other altars were in awe of it. And when he took over, the core uh was his name, Kevin, the core. Was, it was reported on the news even the core was dead he died you know and so this beast took over and so to, to kenny's point that there's a shift in uh perspective in this where where am i is this just a dream is this real right. is this a crazy dream you know and i gotta get the authorities i need help and then all of a sudden it's the beast talking you know this this beast has taken over and so it it does in in light of what sean said really take on the connotations of uh, SRA, which at that point you could say, okay, this is a guy who watched Omen 3 and had a nightmare and wrote a song lyric. And that's like a classic narrative. I think Ride the Lightning, I think James Hetfield said the same thing. I had a dream. I was in an electric chair. Like it's always, you know, and I don't doubt it. Like a lot of, of these dream inspirations happen with Lovecraft and with musicians. And especially when you get, uh, drugs and um, psychedelics and stuff involved, but uh, to to actually follow the narrative of generational Satanism, where these people are being split and the the altars are having these these disassociated 
points of confusion and stepping forward and back and and then this beast taking over you know that's pretty ahead of its time if that lyric was written in 1982 i don't know too many people that knew well, that back then and i guess that's my um <laughs> that's my question were they that cutting edge yeah not saying they weren't i lean towards right. they weren't okay yeah. um just because it wasn't um it, it was it was definitely around back then it's been around for a long long time okay right. uh mpd uh but was it part of the um the public uh you know vocabulary right. i don't think it was like in i think in the late 70s the movie sybil came out okay now yeah. I think it's I think it's a good explanation, and I could to be totally wrong. I kind of lean towards it's not that, but it could it fits it makes sense, right? And right. but also what makes sense to me this makes more sense is the guy in the song becomes possessed, hmm. and that is what happens there. Mm -hmm. So to me that fits a little bit better, and that makes sense. Like if you were watching one of these old. Um, a cult, you know, these movies about a satanic cult, dude, they were a dime a dozen back in the seventies. How many movies, you know, about somebody's driving late at night and they're doing whatever, all of a sudden they see a bunch of people in robes chanting and they're like, <laughs> Oh shoot, we got to get out of here. Then all of a sudden, you know, the, the cults walking real slow towards them and they're all zombified and they're coming after them and the, their car breaks down and they can't get away and they get stuck in the mud and they're running from the satanic cult and they're scared to death of them. Um, Don't yeah, forget. yeah. So again, going back to Satanic Panic, um, all of these bands were, you know, not all of these bands, many of these bands were very open about their involvement in the occult. Mm -hmm. So um, I, I want to know from the listeners, what do they think? You know, um, to me, I think this sounds like one of those 70s, you know, horror movies where you run into a Satanic uh, cult. And I... I kind of want to go back now and do dig a little bit deeper and read the lyrics off of the first two Iron Maiden albums mm -hmm. and see where this stuff came in. And that you would know be, what I mean? That would be um, pre Bruce, Bruce Dickinson, too. That would be before he was the singer. They had a different singer right. in the early years. Paul them, they Paul had, them. Uh, I know the first album, was it the first two albums or was this his first album or his Bruce. second album? Uh, I'm not sure about that. I think I think it was Bruce Dickinson's first album, but it was I think Iron it was. third. Yeah, I think it was. Mm -hmm. So let's go ahead and um, do, is that the end of our clips, or do we? Um, <laughs> is there one more? Maybe thirty one more. Um, we got one more. Here we go. We're gonna finish this out. I think maybe, maybe, maybe not. <laughs> so uh, here we go. <laughs> So I don't know. I kind of think that um, uh, that last line there kind of makes sense to what I'm saying because this guy, it seems like he's been taken over, whether he becomes possessed or switching personalities. Uh, and now, um, Kenny, I, I don't know. Like um, there's, there's obviously, you know, um, uh, a distinction. There's a switch there somewhere. And uh, is it is this the devil talking or the Antichrist talking, you know, the beast, the number of the beast? Or yeah, is this yeah. this guy? It seems like there was a switch there in that in that one chorus. So um, I also keep in mind that a lot of people write songs and it's not as sophisticated and as deep as we make it out to be. You know what I'm saying? And a lot of people oh, yeah. don't like explaining their songs for this reason because they want the listener to kind of have fun or to, you know, uh, when they give an explanation, um, then it takes the fun out or it takes the imagination out of the song. So what are you guys' thoughts on that? No, I, to I totally think the same thing. Like to me, the song sounds like he's like this guy is experiencing these things, whether it's a dream, he's not sure it's very, 
blurry and he doesn't know. But once you get down to the last 666, when he says the number of the beast, 666, the one for you and me, you know, you don't know the, the context of that can be a lot of things because the six is the number of man within biblical type stuff. So you, you look right. at that and say, is he just saying that that's who we are? That situation? I don't know. But to me, the, the narrative changes and the last I'm coming back, I will return and I'll possess your body and I'll make you burn. To me, it sounds like if it's if he's been taken over, then he's then he's definitely been taken over by Satan. I don't know if something's there is going on to it. But, you know, he says, I have the fi fire, I have the force, I have the power to make my evil take its course. It, you know, here's the thing. Was was he really writing from the aspect or did he just need a couple words that rhymed? I don't know. Yeah. I, you know, yeah. you don't know, man. I, I, you really can't put it because I've read lyrics and you'll think, I know this, what's it means. You talk to the artist and it's not even close. Yeah. You're like, yeah. how can yeah. that be? But that's, yeah. you know. Well, and whether intentionally or unintentionally too, we get some good imagery there in that line. I, I'm coming back. I will return. Yeah. Who's the one in scripture that says that the most? Not the mm -hmm. beast, you know, right. and even even though the beast is coming, um, the fact is Jesus is the one that says, I'm coming back. I will return. And so it's almost this unintentional blasphemous association with that. Like I'm coming back. I'll return. But it's to destroy you, not to save you. Right. Um, so so it, it's very possible that we have some Iron Maiden apologists that would show up and watch this. And we've already had some people, you know, uh, uh, trolling us a little bit like, OK, you guys don't know what you're talking about. Mm -hmm. Well, we never claimed that we did. You know, uh, <laughs> this is definitely not our uh, position of authority is uh, heavy metal lyrics. We know a little bit about it. Uh, but uh, anyway, uh, we welcome your comments and, you know, anything that you want to post or anything that you want to share. We're not here to insult the band. We're here to find the truth out and to examine the song. And again, what Vicky said, based on scripture, okay, based on the holy word of God, the breathed out word of God, okay, and uh, the letter, obviously, uh, that uh, John wrote on the Isle of Patmos, okay, uh, the revelation of Jesus Christ. So, the, uh, and here we see, this metal band either twisting it or capitalizing on it and exploiting it, you know, from the early eighties, they're not the only ones. A lot of people did it. Uh, and it was, um, I mean, it served several different pur purposes. One to preach a message, a dark message Two, to make some money. Okay. These guys sold millions of records. All right. And this was the beginning. So they were able to, you know, go forward with this imagery, with these ideas. Um, guys, uh, there's a lot more to say, but um, I want to I want to give um, I want to put up this video of Bruce Dickinson, just maybe commenting a little bit on um, on his thoughts on faith. And this is a little bit, you know, it's not exactly clear what he's talking about, but it seems like he might be referencing Christianity a little bit. So uh, keep in mind, Bruce Dickinson, um, he got diagnosed with throat cancer back in 2015. And I, I thought that was going to be the end of it. You know, I didn't know. And I was like, man, this guy's not going to sing again. Well, actually, he is singing. He's singing next week in Ohio. Uh, they're on tour right now. But um, anyway, um, I, I mean, if. Getting cancer doesn't bring you to faith. You know, I don't know what will. Uh, I would just mention anybody that's watching this far that are believers, lift up these guys, you know, pray for these guys. Um, these guys are basing their lyrics and their songs on the truth. What I mean is it's coming from the source of the truth, but it's not the truth. It's not God's word. There's a song off of their new album uh, that takes place out of the book of Daniel. Okay. Mm -hmm. So uh, it's called The Writings on the Wall. <laughs> now, again, not 100% uh, scriptural, but pulled from that. And I don't know who the lyric writer was, but it's kind of interesting. These guys have had uh, a lot of longevity um, in their, you know, in their career. Let's listen to that. Uh, let's watch this little clip from Bruce Dickinson here. And this is him talking. Not sure exactly what he's referencing, but let's just listen to it here. And it's really, really deep. 
And if that carries on, it's probably a good thing. Personal faith is so personal that I think you you have to um, uh, you have to say that it's you can't communicate it to other people. It's something you hold very deeply within yourself, and the only way that people can access it is themselves, and possibly by seeing somebody else acting in a certain way and sort of going, well, you know, what's what's the big deal with them? You know, what's, what's, you know, what are they, what, what, why do they always seem so happy or glowing or whatever it is, you know, and if it's uh, some kind of justification that, you know, that, that they have and it's, you can say it's faith, then um, people say, well, maybe I should have a bit of that. So um, the one thing I get from that clip is that Bruce Dickinson is lost. He's lost. <laughs> Um, you think I don't even know that he's searching for the truth, right? But it seems like he has witnessed some things mm -hmm. that has him asking questions. Mm -hmm. So, what do you think? Yeah. So, I, I watched a little bit of a longer bit of that clip, and you know, he did say some interesting things. And one of the things he said, and this is very, very standard, especially you know, um with atheist jargon and that is people have invented religion so yeah. that they that their whole life isn't just despair we have to have something to hope for there has to be some sort of meaning there has to be some sort of thing that happens afterwards we can't just die and turn to dust and so i understand that like i i understand that if if there was no god and there was no life after it would be pretty cruel and meaningless but what I don't understand is why then the logic to that conundrum leads to so clearly we've made it up. You know, maybe another explanation is, is that because it would be cruel and meaningless without a God, it's evidence that there is a God. So I, I see that there's logic on both sides of that, depending on what side of the argument brings you most comfort. But what was interesting about Dickinson is he's explaining that as if he believes we've created this and, 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 and I don't believe it, but we've created this idea that there's a God because it would, we would just be in despair if there wasn't something higher out there that was helping us or that was going to save us or whatever. But then he kind of contradicts himself and says, I don't know that I believe this, but I do believe it. And I, I kind of put it on the back burner. Like I don't really tell myself that it's an illusion because it's so frail of an illusion that if I, if it, if it crumbles, then I'll be in this despair I just talked about. So it, it was very interesting the way he sort of laid out the logic. Like I know that God is this thing that we've created so that we don't fall into despair. And yet, even though I know we've just created it, I too cling to this notion of a God because I don't want to fall into that despair. And it was almost like he really didn't know for sure what he did or didn't believe or what he did or didn't want to believe. Definitely a conflict uh, going on in his own mind there. The, the full clip was really fascinating to me. Yeah. I wish we could have played that full clip. Uh, <laughs> there was a lot of stuff in there and I, I actually, um, had planned to play more of that but it's just you know people can go back and, and check it out look it up um now here uh i want to jump into this next clip uh, with uh nico mcbrain here the drummer the longtime drummer of iron maiden now i don't think he was the drummer on the song uh oh. for the album uh the number of the beast but he's been a long time drummer and he's the current drummer of the band now, Katie, if you could put up that article, I want to read this uh, real quickly. And you guys, let me know what you think, if this is legitimate. Uh, Pastor Sean was putting up a warning about this, okay? <laughs> so, and I think that's uh, I think that's legit. We need to, I think his warnings uh, were, uh, uh, you know, uh, very, um, uh, very good. So let's, uh, let's uh, scroll down here. Iron Maiden drummer Nico McBrain gives his life to Christ. And we're going to skip, okay, uh, 
So it seems like there's more to the previously reported collaboration between former Anthrax guitarist Dan Spitz and Iron Maiden drummer Nico McBrain than meets the eye. Cross Rhythms, a UK Christian music resource, posted the following article in February of this year, all quotes taken from Willow Creek Association news feature dated March, April 2001. So this has been quite a while ago. The drummer with million uh, with million selling heavy rock band Iron Maiden has become a Christian. Nico McBrain, who recently finished an 18 month world tour and supported the band's Brave New World album, is now part of a worship team at a Spanish River Church in Florida, USA. The 48 year old musician became a Christian through the witness and prayers of his wife Rebecca. Uh, McBrain, while visiting the Spanish River Church, found himself weeping. I just sat there thinking, I didn't drink last night. Uh, why can't I stand? He told Willow Creek Association News. After praying to receive Christ, he began to read the Bible hungrily. I have this love affair with Jesus going on in my heart. So uh, an Iron Maiden fan became a Christian after McBrain shared his testimony at a church-sponsored coffee house. The way the Holy Spirit touched the room that night was immense, McBrain said. I've never felt that way before or since. The, um, though he, excuse me, though he has played before 250,000 people, McBrain said he was more nervous when he began playing with the church worship team. McBrain told the news that after playing, he felt that he should remain with Iron Maiden, but there was a greater calling on my life. He is considering um, enrolling in some seminary classes without. Uh, without this church and this relationship with God, I don't know where I'd be right now. I just know that I want to be able. Uh, I I just I want to be able to be a use uh, to be able to use my life for God. And it goes on. So that's enough. I want to play the testimonies real quick. And um, I I think you know um, it's it's kind of interesting with people like uh, Brian Head Welch who decided to continue to stay with. Um, with corn, I don't know. I don't know. That seems like a, a major, um, you know, uh, what am I trying to say? Um, yeah, but he actually left corn. He, he did. did. Yeah, he had left and was going, and and his conversion happened during that time. But then he went back to corn. Right. Was, Conflict of interest is what I was trying to say. Right. Right. But, right. So, guys, I don't know. I found this interview today, and this is just a, an excerpt of him talking a little bit about uh, Christianity. And I think, and I'm not saying that he is or he is a Christian. Uh, I'm going to take him at his word. And if anybody has any evidence otherwise, um, I think it's important what Sean said. If he's mixing occultism with Christianity, that's not Christianity. And we reject that, and we expose that. Okay, now he says something here in the second in the second clip where he kind of gets it. Okay, and I'll point that out in a minute. But let's just watch this, and again, we want to hear your feedback and and what you guys think. So uh, he's talking about. I'm sorry, Katie. He's talking about helping people that are uh, have been addicted to drugs in this part, uh, Dude, in these two clips. So go ahead. You know, sometimes yeah. I wake up and it's happening with my wife's rules about where you're miserable. And I go, can't I have a day where I'm not happy? <laughs> I know, <laughs> I know. I'm, Can I have a human day, right? <laughs> you know. So there, there are things in, in life that always are, are obstacles to us. And I think it depends, like, as we were saying, advice for, for kids that, that are wanting to try and get off of drugs. Yeah, get help. Praise God. Ask God's help. He will help you. But all, always seek help those people that are there to help you because they're there for one reason and that is to help you and so then okay then the side the good fight side of life is when you you're effervescent or, or you know have that personality which you so, so kind to say i have is that you try and when you meet people like that are struggling you can help them over the maybe help them over a little bump mm. because life is considered to me is a whole bunch of little bumps that end up being a big one that's true. And all these walks, you know, there's there's things that are going to trip you up. And sometimes we don't look to the cross and we don't look to Jesus in our faith and we turn away. So there's yeah. times when we find, a, find ourselves going down a dark alley. 
That's true. And, That's so and, true. You know, once somebody's already down there, it's your job of a not re- well. It's all of our jobs as yeah. Christian men yeah. and women yeah. to bring those kids back out. Yeah. I, I, I say kids. I mean everybody. I I had a conversation once with a with a, a scholar. So okay, and then uh, she'll skip to the to the next clip here in a in a minute. But what are your thoughts about that? I mean, he's proclaiming Christ. Uh, he, earlier in this interview, he talks about how God helped him quit alcohol and things like this. Uh, you know, on I have to take him at his word there, and I'm waiting for more evidence. You know, and, and I again, I think what Sean said is important. Let's take a look at that. If he's mixing anything with it, it's not Christianity. Period. Hmm. you know don't live ab- above your law you know the no. thing is for me um you know if, if i can just help one person through a bad time or yeah. give them a word of, of not so clever advice yeah or a, a p- particular piece of advice that something that's happened to me yeah that i can pass on and say look this is how this happened to me like you did yeah. explain to those guys to or you know that to, the, by modern standards, a good Samaritan is to pay it forward. Yeah, yeah. Right, you know, um, now we can, anyone can do that regardless of whether you have a faith. Yeah. Or whether you believe in Jesus. Yeah, yeah. Whatever your God may may or may not be, you can still pay forward and still do good. That's now, true. Whether you're not going to get into heaven by that. Yeah. But certainly yeah. it does, it will, will count for the day that you do say, yeah. God, yeah. I believe in your son, mate. Yeah, yeah. Right. But you know the thing is that we learn from experiences in our lives, yeah. and we learn we learn to, to take experiences from other people too. That's true. To be a good listener is very important. That's very important. And not to not to just go off and blaze off and go, yeah, well, well let me tell you about what I me. You know, you've got to be able to, you know, encourage people by listening to them. Yeah. So I think that's enough there. But I don't know if you guys could catch that. The The volume's a little low, and his accent there is, a, is slightly hard to understand. But he said, he, he talked about people of other religions, you know. And he said, you know, um, this is what he said. He said, um, uh, you know, your religion can, you know, can help you, okay? But he said it's not going to get you to heaven. And he made a distinction there. I don't know if you guys caught that. That so. belief in the Son of God is what gets you to heaven. And he wanted to make sure that people understood that. Uh, it's it's not you know it's not super powerful you know um, hit you in the face you know uh, preaching, but it seemed to me that he showed that he understood what it was. So do you think I'm covering up for him, or what do you guys think? <laughs> I don't. I feel to me, listen to him. He he sounds like someone who's genuinely had some kind of uh, a conversion that he's doing it. He may not just be very well spoken to how to get it across. And he's dealt with probably being with people and being in the music industry. He's probably dealt with every kind of religion and all these things going on with it that he probably always felt he was walking a fine line with not wanting to offend someone. But I was impressed by the fact that when he said that, hey, whatever you're you know, you can, you, you, whatever religion you're doing, can, you can do good. He, but then he came in and said, that's not going to get you to heaven. He, he, he knew that distinction. And I think that was really something that, that stuck out for me. And I thought, okay, maybe he's really had something here because that's, that's a sticky point, man. Cause most people want to put the coexist thing on and, and say that there's all these ways to heaven and people get really upset when you say, no, there's not. There's that's no what way. sets us apart as Christians. That's we it. Believe there's that's only it. one way. Yeah. Yeah. This um, is such a tough this is such a tough situation, you know, when someone comes into the public like a celebrity and says, I'm a Christian now. Partially because the word Christian is just so up for grabs now. It can be many things to many different people. And we have to keep in mind too that these guys that have become a Christian within five years, they're babies. Like they're still right. on the right. milk. They they haven't been reading the Bible their whole life. They're not familiar. And I still remember one time. I had led a coworker to Christ, you know, in college. And one day, so she, she got a Bible and she started reading the Bible. And one day I got home from work and I had a voicemail. Like this is the old days of like, uh, uh, the machine. machines. Right. And so I'm listening to my, my messages and it's my friend going, Oh my gosh, King David. 
he cheated on his what he killed a guy like she was shocked like because oh. all she'd ever heard in her little catholic upbringing was king david was this awesome king and warrior and the you know god's you know most beloved and all this and she had never heard that this guy you know committed adultery and murdered a man and she couldn't get her mind wrapped around it and i remember thinking you know i was probably in my 20s at the time how do you not know that? Like it's one of the things he's most famous for after killing the giant, right? So I think that sometimes we have these expectations that as soon as someone takes on that label of Christian, mm -hmm. they're right where you're at and they know all the doctrine and they've heard all the sermons and they're going to explain everything correctly. And I mean, I even have t trouble sometimes when I listen to a sermon where it's a brand new concept or it's some deep theological concept the first time I try to explain that to another Christian, they're like, what is this heresy? Cause, cause I don't even know how to explain sure. it yet. Mm -hmm. So I yeah. think, you know, we're not going to win in one of these situations. Cause you're going to have the people that are like, I can't believe you think he's a Christian cause he's still in that band. And then you're going to have people saying like, of course he's a Christian, no matter what he says. Like there's kind of no way to like, to win in a situation like this. I hope it's genuine. And I hope that, even if some vestiges of his old life and old doctrines and old heroes of, of other faiths are still clinging on and he hasn't been convicted of those things yet. The Holy Spirit hasn't gotten to that part of the list yet. It's not important yet. There's more important things. I, I'd i like to take it at face value and say, this is, this is awesome. And I hope he continues to grow in his faith and I hope it's genuine, but I don't know. Am I, I would, I, how would I know? I hope so too, uh, Vicki. You know, I saw some footage of uh, Brian uh, Head Welch and uh, I guess the other guy, is it Fieldy, that got saved too in corn? So. And they were going out at a corn concert and praying for people. <laughs> and I'm like, what's going on here? Because we don't even see Christian musicians at a Christian concert doing that. Wow. And here these celebrities are, they're going out praying for people at a corn concert. So hmm. I, you know what? I don't know. I don't know. Uh, obviously we are not his judge. That's going to be between him and the Lord. I remember uh, a few years ago when Kanye West came out, Jer Jared and I talked about this and um, Jared was kind of the lead on this and he was doing the research and from everything we understood, Kanye got saved. He explained that he knew what it meant to be saved. And there were credible people, you know, that had vetted this out and said, I think Kanye really got saved. From everything mm -hmm. I can tell, it seems that he, you know, he understands what it means to be saved. And then he is changing his life accordingly. Okay. So again, um, there are people that disagree with me and there were a lot of people at the time that disagree with what we had to say about that. Um, I don't know, uh, who's your favorite preacher? You tell me. And if I wanted to, I could say, you know what? I think he's faking it. Okay. Uh, they could say that about us and they've said that about us. Right. Yeah. So, um, I want to be careful with accusations as well. A lot of these people don't do themselves any favors. Okay. Mm -hmm. Um, we can also say, Hey, when you're transformed, the new man, the old man dies and, and you have the new man and it makes sense to leave corn. It makes sense to leave iron maiden. Okay. Um, and I could also say that of people that get saved, that stay with certain corporations, you know? Yeah. Uh, and I've seen people and I'm like, how are you going to justify working for this, you know, uh, company X here? Because Company X is part of the New World Order, Good okay, point. and you know, uh, you know, how are you going to justify, you know, kind of like uh, how are you going to justify doing this or doing that? You know, it could be anything. We've seen it in a lot in the last two years. Um, just like I don't know, like some of the hospital stuff, you know, uh, or think, you know, things like that. We seen okay. A good example is um, our guest that we had on. You know, um, a couple weeks ago, um, uh, Kenny, uh, your friend up at uh, Dr. Uh, Five and Dimes up there. Um, oh, Tracy? Yeah, Tracy. Tracy where she, she, yeah, she couldn't, with a clear conscience, work for her 
the person that she was working. She couldn't do that anymore. Right. Anyway, right. uh, and I felt I feel like that sh- that might be something that we should see. But okay, guys, since we're talking about the number of beasts, what about let's let's talk about this real quick. The number of the beast, the real number of the beast. What do you think it is? Do you think it's a tattoo? Do you think it's a computer chip? Do you think it's uh? Maybe like a spiritual seal. What do you think? Vic, go ahead. It's a UPC scanner at the grocery store. <laughs> it's don't my go to, yeah, don't go to that, yeah, don't go to the grocery store. Yeah. <laughs> we gotta show Kenny that video. Yeah. <laughs> um <clears throat> that's such a great question, uh, Tom, because like we so thought we had that figured out in the 80s, you know. Mm-hmm. Oh man, it's gotta be this chip. It, it, it's going to be this chip, you know, but now, I mean, we've already gone so far beyond the chip. And now, even just in the last few years, with all the speculation of what's going on in the medical field and all of the stuff that people are saying now about changing human DNA, and maybe it's even the whole changing of the DNA and you're hearing about Elon Musk's neural lace. And so I think even the, this idea of a microchip is like so outdated now it's almost comical. And I almost just wonder if between now and the time that this, this, this number is, is even this mark is launched. I, I wonder if the technology is something that's kind of beyond the public scope of understanding at this point. I do think it'll be something extremely technological and on a quantum level. Something I'm leaning towards something DNA related. Mm-hmm. I don't know. What do you got, Ken? I, I yeah, you know, honestly, it's uh for me, as the more <laughs> I've studied things, I've always felt like that. Uh, when they talk about, you know, everybody gets really worried about, oh, I get the mark of the beast. I won't be able to buy or sell or food or all these things. And I say, that's only a part of it. What you really have to look at is when you're seeing is that, that the mark also is for the people is that you have to deny Christ. That's a big part of it. And to me, it doesn't matter whether they sneak something in our bodies or do something to it. This, the last part is contingent on you. You mm-hmm. have to, with that in con- Together, have to, you know, it's going to be like, well, you can't buy, you can't sell, you can't do this, we're going to kill your family, da, da, da. are you going to deny Christ? So it is. And they're going to have some kind of option there, you know, go into it. So I, I don't know what it really is because, I mean, you know, we thought it was a chip for, you know, so long. And then it could be just your thoughts and your head. You don't know what's your your hand and your head. It just, you know, I, I, don't, I don't think we're going to truly know until it actually happens and i think when it's there is when people are going to be like especially christians will know this is it people that are not christians are going to go right along with it and be like oh i can do this and this allows me to be in the whatever other you know metaverse or something or whatever you don't know i i I don't know i think i think there's a split there i'm not totally sure they'll be lining up willing to pay fifteen hundred dollars for it you know that's right. Because I mean, Which they, we they even with what, even with yeah, I was gonna say even with like the nefarious like we know this is nefarious technology. We know they right, spy absolutely. on us. We know, but what do we do as Christians? Even like, oh, I'm gonna get the 13 now because I can't get my camera to work. Or so right, you know, th- right. there's a point where Christians are gonna say, no more, no more. I, I can't do this anymore. But people are lining up, spending thousands of dollars and paying monthly right. for this, That's and right. they're gonna do the same thing for that mark because it's gonna yeah, be. Yeah, I, I t- here's something I want to think about. We're talking about with this song and, and just in pretend, particular, you know, back it's still it's still there's a lot of ambiguity to this song. I mean, there is stuff like this. What I think is really amazing and what's kind of scary is that stuff's very ambiguous. But we're living in a time now where the songs that are truly satanic bands, they're not ambiguous. I had an article come across on my Facebook on Sunday from a satanic band called Revocation. Now, this guy, he's telling it. He really talks about it. He, he's, this is what he says in this article. He says, um, reading sort of the tenets of the satanic temple, those feel much more kind of real and humanitarian than the Ten Commandments, let's say. 
just in terms of modern day, how to sort of live your life. I think if you had just kind of erased all religion and just did a mind wipe on humanity and presented them with two stone tablets, one was the Ten Commandments, one was the tenets of the Satanic Temple, but you didn't tell which one was which, I think people maybe more, he says, wait, I think probably maybe more people might choose the seven tenets than the Ten Commandments. It certainly feels more humanitarian. And I went, I had to look at the stuff and I looked at it and I said, well, of course it sounds more humanitarian. It's all about you. That's not just the whole point with that. I get that. But I read that. And then what's really crazy is right after that, they're talking about the song. They put nihilistic violence. And the guy says, it'll take your head clean off and light your decapitated body on fire. Take that, Ten Commandments. That's what it says right in the thing. And I went, come on, man. I just... It, Unbelievable. Unbelievable. Because oh. I feel like that's just pull up onto it because people read it. And of course, if they don't have you know what Christ, I say? Oh. Say yeah, I know. <laughs> I, I was wondering if there was if one of the seven is a mating signal. <laughs> yeah. <Is it what? laughs> We're still trying to figure out the mating call or the mating oh. signal. And, yeah. Anton, Le, Anton LeVay, we were talking on Monday about his 11 commandments. And number oh. five is don't don't like uh, make sexual advances at someone unless they give you the mating signal. But they don't tell you what the signal is. The mating <laughs> signal. What? Yeah. yeah, I don't know. Call what is that? Oh, I my gosh. Know. That's got to be. <laughs> <I> just, <laughs> ah, ah, what, 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 what? That's it, man. I think she's into me. I don't know, man. I would <laughs> ask her out. <laughs> what a different time period, man. Woo, could <laughs> be dancing That's like a gorilla. I don't know. What if you get it wrong? Right. Um, oh, gosh. Oh, man. <laughs> guys, we could go on and on yeah. about the mark of the beast. Uh, I, You know what? I don't know. I mean, I think it could be a combination of things. Definitely like a spiritual seal. And I feel as a Christian that uh, we are sealed for Christ, right? And um, well, also want to say that uh, I think people need to heed Pastor Sean's warning about this music, okay? Um, yeah. I think that there are definite, you know, uh, uh, these songs can be charged, okay? Yeah. And we, this is not an endorsement of the song or the band or the drummer or anything. Okay. Um, you, uh, you proceed with caution and I would do anything, you know, forge with scripture, let scripture be your guide. Okay. And we think of, um, let me just, uh, look this up real quick here and, uh, share in Philippians and we'll, we'll, we'll close with this guys. Um, as soon as I find it, while you're finding, can I say something real quick? Yeah, go ahead. Uh, I also feel like what Pastor Sean said, I totally agree with that. That there could be stuff, but I really, this is what I've kind of come across in my research with I'm doing on a lot of frequencies and stuff that intention changes things. I could take a very piece of scripture and read it in the intent of being evil or using it nefariously. And it may have that take because that's what I'm trying to do with it. Mm -hmm. And I think what's interesting, you can see pop songs now that have that kind of, you're like, okay, they're singing about this, but then you know the intention is completely different. There's a lot of songs, and a lot of stuff's geared toward young people, young kids. And you're like, you know, Harry Styles from One Direction, he had a song called uh, Watermelon Sugar. Kids would come in and say, hey, I want to learn to play Watermelon Sugar. And I watched the video and said, I'm not going to teach you that song. And you can talk to your parents about it. But it was, you know, it was not what you thought. And it was so I feel like there's intention also with this, man, that you can you can do some things. And uh, and it can be that the lyrics are meant to be nefarious or mm -hmm. used that way. Mm -hmm. Guys, this is just our opinion. We try our hardest to read God's word and to form a biblical opinion, a godly opinion, but we're definitely not perfect at it. We're human beings. Um, and as I've said many times, I like things that I shouldn't like, but I reject anything being king of my heart except for Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. And the war in the flesh are at war. They have been a long time. Yeah. So um, anyway, uh, let, me, let me just read this here real quick. Um, 
Philippians chapter 4, verse 8. Finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. And I think that's the best advice uh, that we could uh, that we could give, that we could get. Guys, if you like this content, please subscribe, please share, give us a thumbs up, hit the bell, all of that stuff. We have been going live uh uh, several nights a week, um, we have shows, uh, six nights a week, actually, is what I'm trying to say. And, uh, er, you know, earlier in the week, we talked about Anton LaVey, Alistair Crowley, Satanism. Uh, if you're interested in checking out our other shows, shows we, do we do interviews, all of that stuff. And of course, we are, uh, have been covering, uh, Vicky's book. They only come out at night. So all kinds of content. Maybe this is your first time. Uh, hanging out with us. And if, if it is your first time hanging out with us, I can't believe you made it to an hour and 30 minutes. We're not going to keep you anymore. We will see you next time. All right. All right. Bye. Hey, folks. I just met the witches and Satanists, and they're going to allow me to do an interview with them. So let's see what happens.